Why should someone get into kit bashing? It wasn't until I started putting the models together that I kind of decided that I wanted them to look a little bit different, but I didn't know how to do that. I decided the only way I would know if that worked would be to buy them and find out. <laughs> and that's what that ended up as. What is that from? What is that from? <laughs> If you're a long-term listener of the podcast, you'll know how important it is to have the right tools to aid you in your painting. And if there's one piece of equipment that I could never live without, it's my Onyx lamp from Native Lighting. It doesn't matter what brush or paints you have if you can't see what you're doing in the first place. The Onyx is the perfect lamp for miniature painting because it's super bright, 2,200 lumen LEDs cast soft and diffused light on your models without any harsh shadows. And its daylight balanced color temperature of 6,500K gives you the confidence that the colors you are painting are accurate. As someone with a very small hobby desk, by far my favorite feature though, is its articulating arm, which clamps to the side of your desk, maximizing your workspace. It's also super adjustable, so you can sit comfortably in the perfect painting position without sacrifice. It also folds up into a compact shape, which is great if you like to travel to paint with your friends. To upgrade your setup and order yours now, head to siegestudios.co.uk forward slash shop or head to the link in this episode's description. Hello everyone, and welcome to Paint Perspective, episode 61. Got another guest. Another we're, one. We're lining them up, Joe. It's not me this time. People keep calling me a guest because they keep disappearing <laughs> and then coming back. I'm not the guest. <laughs> well, you've seen the title of the video. We're joined, of course, by none other than Kirioff. Hello. I'm, I'm doing my best to not sweat all over the camera. Yeah, we're, yeah. we're recording this on like one of the hottest days of the year. I think so. it's the hottest day of the year so far. This office gets really hot anyway. Um, and George isn't letting us put more than one fan on because we have to edit the sound. So, Well, the viewers expect good audio quality. So, uh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Sacrifices we make. For I was going to say that means it's your fault. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, if by some miracle someone listening doesn't know who you are, uh, would you like to just uh, mention the channel? What is you do? Yeah, I mostly talk about miniatures and that's pretty much it. That's the whole channel at this point. Just any model or miniature that I find fun or interesting or not quite as fun or interesting as I think it should be. <laughs> um, I'm not pointing any fingers at like the new Inquisitor Cody has or anything like that. <laughs> but yeah, pretty much just anything miniature related. Mostly Games Workshop, but starting to kind of move out into like 3D printed stuff as well. And just if it's cool and it's small... I, I want to talk about it. Oh, well, I like that. No, that's, a cool that's, that's a good tagline. That's a good tagline. Did you just come up with that? Or yeah, said I that think already? I should actually keep that. You should keep that. You should use that, yeah. that yeah. for some no, Yeah, one of the cool things about your channel, actually, is that um, I think it fulfills like a little bit of a unique space because you're like almost a news show, but almost yes. a podcast, but just also it's a lot of like personality. It's a lot of yourself. It's not just like faceless presenter. Yeah. So it's kind of like almost vlogs meets podcast meets news yeah i i'm i still not really sure how to describe it other than just talking about models because it's just it's just become that and it used to be every single part of the hobby but then the less that i had time to play the less i got like interested in like different rules and keeping up to date with codexes and stuff and the more i was just like well most of my hobby is painting or converting so i'm going to talk about the things that i like to paint and convert and that makes way more sense than trying to keep up with you know However, however many different systems there are at this point, <laughs> yeah. which I was trying to do before. Um, and when you've got two kids that are like under 10, you yeah. don't get time for that. Yeah. That's not allowed. Yeah. <laughs> you've got like a, a certain amount of time and you get that and then the rest of it is gone. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a case of just the miniatures. We'll do just that. Yeah. It's, quite, it's quite a unique take on, I guess, enjoying the hobby as well because um, one of the things we talk about is like kind of become the cornerstone of this entire podcast now has become like, doing the hobby the way you enjoy it rather yes. than just doing it the way everyone else does it for the sake of it. But equally, I think you're quite, well, maybe not too unique, but like unique to us at least as painters is your, when you look at models and when you look at the releases, you're talking about like the sculpt, the detail. Oh, I could use this part for this and kit bash it for this. Yeah. I don't want to shadow that too much. We'll get into that in the main topic later on. But I think like for us, when we look at models, it's like, oh, look how well they've painted that. And oh, I could paint this like that. But you're, yeah, so well, I like we're looking at the paint job that's already been done. Yeah. We're not even like looking, like thinking, oh, I could do this. I could do this. We're that's just yeah. looking and getting excited about something that someone else has already done. That's why I quite enjoy your videos actually though, because you'll like almost point out details for me. Yeah. I'll be like, oh yeah, no, he's right. There is something there. Like, I won't, I won't spot things straight away. You've got a really good eye for like the sculpts. Yeah. I get like properly sort of. I have a very particular thing that I like, but I can't really nail down necessarily what it is. It's just like 
Fair for me is a perfect mix of kind of blank canvas where you can do what you like to it and having enough detail that you can also look at it and know immediately what faction it is, whether it's like just standard infantry or elite infantry or a leader or something like that. There's like Games Workshop have got really good at doing really detailed miniatures, but there's still for me like a perfect balance between kind of everything being super detailed and having loads of ornamentation and it being just blank enough that you could take that and make it whatever you wanted, which I don't know how to like <laughs> narrow that down into <laughs> yeah. a sensible way of describing things, but it's just meant that every time I see something new, I'm like, there's at least like four or five things I love and a few things that I would change. And then that's just become the whole format for most like reveal videos and stuff. But it does also mean that I'm in the slightly hypocritical position of not being able to make miniatures. <laughs> I was talking about them a lot, which I'm trying to fix. But that again comes down to there's only so many hours in a day. It turns out learning to sculpt miniatures like digitally or with like green stuff, kind of hard. Yeah. <laughs> kind of difficult, seems it seems. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> It's sim that's similar argument to though, like you get that in other industries with like any, not that you're necessarily like critiquing or reviewing in that way, but like film critics who maybe aren't filmmakers yeah. and things like that. I don't think you necessarily have to be good at the thing. You could arguably, again, because of the time investment that both of those things cause, whether you're even making it or just talking about it, you could argue that not spending time making them has led you to have a better understanding of uh, like reviewing them and, yeah. and noticing things on them and stuff like that. It's a lot of things for the designers to juggle as well because they've got to make something that's like physically possible to cast. Yes. And additionally, like adding details to kind of cater for everyone. It's like if you're a painter that, you know, isn't good at freehand and transfers and stuff, giving someone a blank banner is not their idea of fun. They would rather yeah. have all the detail and they could do like a bit more of like a paint by numbers. Whereas some other painters would be like, oh, I wish all the banners were bare or I wish they didn't have all this extra detail on them. They've kind of got to tread this line of like making a model that is accessible for everyone and is also like physically possible to make. You see them like uh, with a lot of releases, you see the difference in, you know, sometimes like a, a new Marine comes out and it's like on a tiny little sprue and it's in seven parts yeah. or the equivalent size model might come out for like AOS and it's like crazy detail and it's in like 150 pieces. Yeah. Um, I think it's one of those things where it's like, it's a, it's a bit of a thankless task because when they get it right, it gets oh, like pushed yeah, over yeah, most yeah, of the yeah. time. But when they get it wrong, or if the general consensus is they got it wrong, they will hear about it for like years. It's, I mean, that's something that I feel like has just changed over the years. Where like the negative side of things just lasts longer, mm. and for whatever reason, YouTube is really good at like pushing negativity out way better than positivity. Like the. The Inquisitor Kochias model, I didn't really like that. And the video about that is doing way better than the one about the new Blood Angels characters, which I liked both of those. Mm. But one of them was like more negative titled, and the other one is a lot more positive titled, and the positive one just isn't doing as well. And I'm just sure it's down to just this kind of weird algorithm shift of the more annoyed people are, the more they click. Yeah. So yeah. we'll give them more stuff that you know, activates that. And it does mean that Games Workshop is, like you say, kind of in a position of just, they'll do like a whole run of incredible miniatures. People go, these are great. And then they'll do one that people don't like. And then you don't hear anything about the ones that people did like for weeks afterwards. Yeah. It's just like, yeah, we made a misstep and that's all people know. Yeah. They don't want to think about the stuff that we've done right for a while. They're just going to focus on this specific bit, which is kind of, I don't know. It's not like, setting necessarily but it does kind of every now and again i'll make a video and i'll go oh i didn't really like this one and that means it's going to do better and i actually don't like that i would prefer it if everything did the same <laughs> yeah because yeah. then it's a much more even balanced view of like not just sort of you know your own opinion but also what games workshop does do because they do have to try and please pretty much everyone all of the time which is completely impossible yeah like there's no way of making it so that you know everyone who is a fan of an old version of a model will also love the new one because you've got to change certain things as you change the models. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it's like also just on the topic of that because that is definitely a thing like we've noticed. We try and 
not to be too like negative yeah. leading on any of our stuff, especially because it's like mostly, um, you know, we, we people are just listening to us while they're painting. They want to just enjoy their hobby time. We don't yeah. want to hear us sitting here like moaning about about things. However, even just certain things that have a negative connotation, for example, if we were talking about if we did an episode talking about mistakes that people might make, yeah. rather than here's five tips that you could do. Just naturally, that's just a different topic, and that's not really trying to lean into anything negative. But because the wording is like slightly more negative yeah. inherently, um, it's more popular. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, yeah it is. I think that is just a natural like human thing that people lean into that. Unfortunately, like they like they think it's drama. Like they think it's like, yeah, I don't know. They think it's like juicy gossip. Or something. I, I I think as well, maybe just specifically with what we do, but like I think. Um, mistakes are something that I think maybe people feel like they can stop doing right away. Whereas a, a tip or a skill is like something they've got to reach. Yes. If that makes sense. I feel yeah. like may, maybe as a listener, you feel like, oh, this is like something I can do quickly now. Yeah. Like I'll get the instant result if I find out what I'm doing wrong rather than what I need to do right and develop. Yeah. If yeah. that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, like a, like a, an instant fix to a problem that you might not even know you had. Exactly. It's just a case of, well, I need to watch this because if I'm doing all of these, then I will immediately be way better at the thing I want to be good at. Mm. Whereas, yeah. you know, oh, that's a good example, actually. Yeah, maybe, I, maybe it was a, I could use different. Yeah, maybe it's frustrating that's for us though, because we, we don't want to pitch stuff negatively. But like, if, if people watch the positive videos, we wouldn't have to. <laughs> yeah. <on occasion. laughs> yeah. I think that's a good point though to say about your channel is that like where there is because it is like you say it's like you're in this position where it's just you talking about stuff and you giving your opinion. There's no real like. There's certain channels that you could find where you're like, I know I'm going to go there to find out the thing, the negative stuff. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Like, and I, you can understand to a certain extent if that being your living and those videos doing better, why you might start to lean into that a little bit more. But the fact that you don't obviously maintains the integrity of the channel, which is, I think, probably leads to why it's been successful for so long as well. You've, you've been making videos for a very long time. Like we, I was actually done like a little bit of a, a quick scan on YouTube just before we started filming this. You've been making, I know you've been, you used, you've spoken about it before. You used to make like gaming videos and such, but yeah. even the videos in like this your is, current format. George is going to say something about him being young. This is what this is <laughs> no, going to no, be. No, at. No. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to, this is going it, to. It's not that. It's that even disregarding like your older style of content, even the videos in the same style that you do now, yeah. you've been doing for longer than I've even been in the hobby. <laughs> well, there you go. That counts. That counts. That was George saying that he's young. Uh, but it's not, it's not so much that. It's that like, I find it, what Joe was saying, like it stood the test of time, like that format. Yeah. I feel like, I feel like it's just sort of got more, weirdly, it's got more like honed and also a bit more chaotic <laughs> just because there's things I've found that, I think it's also very easy to get quite like, not like holier than thou, but kind of really, really focus in on everything has to be perfect when it comes to YouTube, especially when you look at like some of the really big channels that, you know, have got insane production values mm -hmm. and, you know, there's 800 cameras following a thousand people doing a bunch of stuff and it's all seamless and stuff. That's, that's fine. And there are some really good like 40K channels and AOS channels who do super tight edited like battle reports and content and stuff. But I, I've always felt like the bits where you mess up, depending on the, like the what you're talking about, at least those are the bits that make you seem more you. Oh, 100%. like no one is completely perfect. No one like runs a completely perfect shoot of anything. Things always go wrong. It's just whether you include that or not. And it just got to the point one like after a while where I was like. I keep redoing intros. Like for some reason, I just stopped being able to do intros. I really struggle to actually say what I wanted to say without either running long or being so short that it felt very abrupt going into it. And there was a point where I had, I can't remember what video it was, but I just was like, I redid the intro like five times. And on the fifth one, I was like, that was terrible. You know what? Whatever. <laughs> and then I just carried on and I just left that bit in. I just left a little conversation with myself in. And it got a weirdly positive reception. It was just like, oh, you do mess things up. And I'm like, yeah, that's why I edit my videos. That's why yeah. everyone edits, because yeah. you make mistakes. But then from that point on, I was just like, if it makes me laugh, if the if like the thing that my mess up makes me laugh at, in the moment, then I'm just going to leave it, because mm. it'll make someone else laugh probably. And it's not that big a deal if you don't get like one particular aspect completely nailed down. 
as long as you say what you're trying to say about the subject, how you get into it, does it does it actually matter that much? Like, are yeah. people going to turn off because you acknowledge the fact that that wasn't smooth? Anyway, like, most people don't care. And it just sort of adds to, I don't know, the fun of doing it, I guess. Mm. Well, I think it adds to, like, the kind of charm and personality of it because, like, you feel like you're getting to know you rather than... It's like I said, like, if you was, like, a faceless news reporter doing the videos that you do, and it was very matter-of-fact, like... Uh, unopinion unopinionated statements and everything was like really really yeah. crisply polished edit and you was in like a perfect studio and everything was really like I, I think that, that we're actually starting to see in other industries like me and joe are quite like into just the ethos of youtube in general yeah. and we're starting to see in other genres they're kind of being like a pushback against like the really high production value now i feel like within the last like three four five years especially everything was about like you know cinema cameras and crazy budgets and now some of the best performing channels are literally a guy holding a camera and then a guy talking to it and they mess up and stuff's yeah. like rough and ready. It's like going back again. Like, yeah. I don't want to bring this up every time we have another YouTuber on the show, but I've been watching YouTube since for, for early, early, since it started, like um, 2005, 2006, and those first wave of vloggers and, and all this. And, and I've craved that sort of thing again. <laughs> like it just left, didn't it? It yeah. went to something else. And, yeah. and I think um similar thing to what i said when dave from mini wargaming was on here was that like they have gone a higher production value but also tried to maintain the level of personality and everything that yeah. came through at the start you can you can i think you can definitely get a mix of both like things for like i i, I don't use i use for ages just a, i think it was a logitech c920 webcam or something because i had it and it worked and it worked well enough that i never felt the need to replace it and then I finally, it finally died. And I was like, I should, I, instead of buying another one, I should probably actually get a camera, like an actual yeah. good camera, because this is getting silly. Like there's <laughs> other people doing similar videos who have got like four camera setups and they can do battle reports and they can actually film painting miniatures with something that isn't a phone. And yeah. I should probably do something about this. And I got a, I think it was a Canon M50 Mark II. Mm -hmm. And I set that up. And as soon as I started using it, I was like, I should have done this years ago. <laughs> this is like, it's so much better. The picture quality is better. It's so much more like I can get better focus. I can make it slightly out of focus in the back. I actually have the option to change the lenses out if I really want to lean into that. I can actually use it to film. Why didn't I do this before? But at the same time, having replaced it, I immediately was like, I've got all these good ideas now that I could do to change things up. <laughs> Tried it and went, it doesn't feel like the channel. Yeah, do that. Too far. I, yeah. I don't like this new like style of video I've tried because I have this new equipment, I'm going to stick with what I was doing before, but it just looks a bit better now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's the thing with like, um, if you watch Adam Savage's Tested channel, yeah, yeah. like his videos are great. He uses an old iPhone. That's that's <laughs> yeah. his audio equipment. He's got an old iPhone. He's got a, a microphone that he plugs into it. There was a, there's a, a tech YouTuber who went to like review his setup. Yeah. <laughs> and Adam Savage is just like, so this is my old iPhone. This is a really creaky arm. I attach it to <laughs> benches with, and uh, this is the microphone I plug into it. He's like, okay, what else have you got? And he's like, no, no, that's it. That's the whole thing. That's what I use for every video. That's all I do. He's like, okay, right. Well, I mean, it works. Annoyingly. It's like it's weirdly on brand for Adam, Adam Savage. Savage yeah. Like, yeah, I just <laughs> bung this together, yeah. put it on there. I think it's myself. In, in a way, almost like if you'd told us like, oh yeah, well behind the scenes, I have like all this crazy camera equipment. And you actually don't see it, but behind my desk, there's, you know, yeah. production crew. I'd be like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> If you enjoy listening to these podcast episodes every single week, I'd like to ask that you could please do us one small, tiny favor in return and hit that subscribe button on YouTube or the follow button on your podcast app. It takes only two seconds and it really, really helps us out and it allows us to bring you these episodes for free every single week. Thank you so much. Back to the episode. Let's rewind a little bit. Uh, let's do a little bit of background on like your entry into the hobby then. Because obviously, as everyone knows, like you're obsessed with the kit bashing and all that. But Let's like rewind it all the way to like grassroots. Like, how did you get started in the hobby, and how what was the sort of path to where you are now in terms of like your own personal hobby? Yes, that was basically I, I was invited to watch some friends play forty k when I think back in two thousand and three. Uh, I hate thinking about how long ago that was. <laughs> every time I'm like, it's getting it's getting a year further away. Every time <laughs> I don't like it. Um, but they all played, and I they knew I had a big love of sci-fi and they were like there's this sci-fi game where you can take an army and you know play against other people's armies do you want to give it a try and the first game that i saw was a, was a 
like three way fight. So not the way you were supposed to play 40k, <laughs> even in 2003. Um, and so immediately I was like, well, okay, how does this work? Because you've got a bunch of dudes in armor, you've got like just a bunch of guys and tanks. I think it was Space Force, Imperial Guard, and Eldar was the first one, or it was Tyranids, one of the two. But it was like three completely different, three things. very different worlds, yeah, like very, <laughs> very different. Of it. Um, setups and they were like, well, yeah, do you want to have a go? So I ended up playing and immediately went home and was like, I need to start playing 40k. <laughs> I need to find out where you buy this stuff. I want to try it. Um, and ended up going for Chaos Space Marines and Iron Warriors specifically, because as soon as I started reading through the codex, I noticed that you could have basically more tanks if you took Iron Warriors because <laughs> you could drop two fast attack selections for an extra heavy support. And even then, with having no, no real knowledge of the rules, I was like, does this mean I can just have another tank? And they're like, yes. <laughs> okay, so, so, so <laughs> I'll take them then. I'll take that. I'll have loads of tanks and the guys in armor. That's like <laughs> the best combination. So, so um, the game was the pull for you. It wasn't like the miniatures necessarily? It was the game initially. Yeah. yeah. Um, it wasn't until I started putting the models together that I kind of decided that I wanted them to look a little bit different. But I was also quite young and inexperienced with miniatures. <laughs> so I didn't know how to do that. It was literally a case of, I've got an Iron Warrior Sergeant. I want him to have a bigger chainsword. I have two chainsaws. I will cut one off at the tip and one off at the hilt and glue them together, <laughs> which obviously looked terrible. <laughs> so big seam of glue, like halfway down the blade. I think it was crooked and off to one side as well, because I didn't know what I was doing. Um, I turned the Demon Prince into a sort of, Doc, like Doc Ock style demon prince who had, he was supposed to have cables coming out with like blades on the end, but I didn't know how to use green stuff. So I just rolled it into like a like sausage shape and then just stuck it on the demon prince. <laughs> it looked not good. Like I, I found a bunch of it a few years ago and I was like, oh, young me was terrible at this. <laughs> really bad. This isn't great. Um, but that kind of opened up the idea of, well, I can just make this look different to other people's. Like we had a local gaming club that met up and there was a good number of people there and everyone had multiple armies. And so it was a case of no matter what you picked, probably someone had something similar. And I just thought, well, I don't want mine to look like theirs. I kind of want mine to look like mine, even though it's got to stay you know, relatively similar or sensible. Um, it also didn't help that I think, I can't remember which which white dwarf it was, but there was a white dwarf that had a full like custom orc army and it was a speed freaks army. And it was back when games workshop would put stuff in that wasn't games workshop stuff. Mm. Um, and I'm trying to remember the name of the army, but he'd taken like old RC cars and he'd taken like mm. um, Lego wheels and stuff. And he'd built this like cult of speed and half of it was nothing to do with games workshop but it was all like kit bashed and converted. I feel um, like I've heard people reference this, this specific I've, army before. I've I never think, seen a picture of it. I think I might have that white dwarf saved somewhere. Uh, I think I might at least have a digital version. So if I find it, I'll send it over. Cause it's like, it's we can just, get a picture of it somewhere. Cause I feel like if, I've if heard... it's on screen now, we found it. If it's <laughs> yeah. not, sorry, we couldn't find it. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Cause I feel like I've heard people reference that specific yeah. thing before. It was just the scope of it. It was just like, here's a full army. Everything has been changed. Absolutely yeah. everything. Like not one thing was left standard and you know, half the stuff in there wasn't games workshop. It was just toys and parts from other things just used to make this really good cohesive army and i ended up starting orcs kind of after seeing that and not going quite as far as that because i still didn't really have the same like level of expertise or anything but just deciding that well i could use trucks or i could use rhinos and do that instead and yeah. i could i could like try and find like an actual similar battle wagon to the one that was in the magazine, or I could take a land raider and I could take a chimera and just mash them together and create something out of that. And that did a lot to kind of solidify the idea of you can just change whatever you want, whenever you want. Mm. Um, so for quite a few years, it was a case of trying to get used to that. And then promptly all 40 K stopped because everyone moved away. So everyone went either went to university or they moved out of the town 
Um, the gaming club shut down, so there wasn't enough people to keep it running. So that just fell apart. So it went from kind of a lot of investment to no one near me plays this. Yeah, this is the thing I was going to ask was, did you have the break? Well, by the sounds Everyone of it, though, has... your break was a little bit different because most mostly when you hear about the break, it's like, well, I was a teenager and Warhammer wasn't cool anymore. So I took a break for that. But it sounds like you was kind of like forced out of it a little bit. Pretty much, yeah. There was just no one around who played. Um, like, it, we all sort of went our separate ways and there was no real, there was no real kind of drive to find anywhere else because the central place where you went to play 40k or buy 40k that shut down the organized mm. club that met like every couple of weeks that shut down and the guy who ran it was the same one who ran the shop so it was a case of well he's out yeah completely no one's left around to do anything with it so mm. it ended up just getting packed up and like stuck in the loft for years and years and years and it wasn't until years later when my first daughter was born that i was like I want to get back into this. Like, it, I think it'd be fun to do. I kind of been toying with it a bit beforehand. Me and a friend had started, like we'd bought some units and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I specifically remember buying an Imperial Knight just because I couldn't believe that that was a thing that existed now. <laughs> it was just like, when I stopped playing, the only people who had flyers were orcs. So like the, <laughs> yeah. the game had changed so much. Yeah. And then coming back and seeing like this, you know, massive model that, Previously, there was nothing that big that you could mm. really take. I think maybe the Stomper for the Orcs was the only other thing. But like that was, you know, this was like an Imperium unit and you could use it with Space Marines. It just didn't exist before. Um, what what year was that sort of roughly you was getting back into it? Was it like in, well into like YouTube being a thing and all that? Yeah, it, yeah. Was, well into, it was well into YouTube. Um, so Because that's like where a lot of people pick it up is because there's just so much media for this stuff now online and it's yeah. like quite popular online. And there's like a massive community for it. That's brought a lot of people. I mean, COVID is the cliche time. That everyone got back into it. But even now it's like so re-accessible for everyone. Yes. You get what I mean? Yeah. I think I started kind of just picking kits up here and there around 2014, 2015. But right. I wasn't like really looking into it. It was just a case of, I just fancy something new to do. Kind of tested the waters a little bit. And then once my first daughter was born, she spent a while in hospital. And mm. so I had a couple of months where I couldn't really work because I was just basically going to the hospital to sit there for about eight hours a day next to the incubator and just sort of hoping everything be okay. And then coming home feeling like totally exhausted because you haven't done anything, but it's just stress mm. all day. Yeah. Um, and so I'd come home and be like, I don't want to play video games. I don't want to look at a screen. I don't know what I want to do. I'll do some, I'll do some, I'll put something together. I'll just build a unit or paint something. Um, like the building side of thing became very like therapeutic during all of that because you could just sit there and put a thing together and the world stopped existing outside mm. of the desk. It was just, this is the task. Nothing else is happening. We hear this from so many people. Like the escapism for this hobby has been like obviously so invaluable for so many people going through like difficult times. Yeah. It's something 100%. that like I resonate with personally and I think like a lot of people do, a lot of guests we've spoken with. Um, yeah. The, it's the, the reintroduction is often triggered by something like that yeah. i think like i think for someone like george who only got into it for the first time uh, what four years ago or something uh it's 2018 i think yeah 29, so, it's 2019 so yeah. from then onwards it's probably a little bit different because i think you're probably finding more people now getting into it for the first time in their 20s or something than you did before but for for prior to that when it was for a while like oh yeah i was into it when i was 12 um until i was 15 and now then i wasn't for a little while it, and then for those people like me finding it again in later life yeah. as an adult is usually it usually comes down to this thing of like it be yeah serving some kind of therapeutic like um escapism helping with a difficult situation kind of thing I don't know what that is about it. Like that, that it's just this. That. I, I think for me personally, it's because it's like it's this lovely little bubble online for one that like hasn't got a care in the world other than this. Like we all talk about this one thing. We're from yeah. completely different walks of life, but like we've all got this one thing in common. And not only is it in common, everyone's incredibly passionate about it. Yeah. Mm. And then additionally to that, because this is like fantasy universe, and you can do it in so many different ways, it fits so many different personality types because you can be really into the law. Or you can be really into the collecting or really into the kit bashing or really into the yeah. sculpting or really into the painting. Like it fits so many people 
but it's this like one commonality. It brings so many people together. Um, and like you said, it's a level of escapism and like, it's almost like, like you said, kind of therapeutic, like yeah. doing it. Yeah. So I think even if you've got a lot going on in the world, if you can just spend two hours in an evening sat at your desk and just enter like a trance of this like entirely different space. It is specifically because you've obviously just said it as well, but it's specifically the building. Yeah. A lot of people yeah. say, and I agree with it. Yeah. For some reason, that part of it feels more therapeutic than the rest of it. As, as someone who paints, like, uh, sorry, as someone who building the models is a means to paint them. And yeah. I spend a hell of a lot more time painting than I do building stuff. I still find the building therapeutic and yeah. painting. Yeah. Not that it's not relaxing, but like I'm in a different state of mind. Like mm. when I'm when I'm building models, I love having a film on and I'm just like, this can take as long as it needs to. And I'm just sitting there with my scalpel blade and it's just like this repetitive task. And then the stakes are a little bit higher when you're painting. So you don't want to make mistakes. So yeah, maybe that's it. Yeah. Maybe that's it. Is that maybe where the the I suppose the the love for kit bashing and making them unique and everything was already there from before. But yeah. when you got back into it, is it because kind of where the building was the, the I think so. part yeah. is that where the kit bashing comes back into it as well yeah it was it was like a not a kind of how do i drag this out but more of i guess like wanting to put more of what i wanted into the model and i was very bad at painting the whole time <laughs> like i was i was the the person who would show up with like a gray tide until i was told <laughs> yeah. off and then be like okay the orcs are now green. They look awful, but they're now green. So you're not allowed to complain at me. <laughs> um, and it like it took a long time for actually painting to be a thing that I uh, that I enjoyed and felt like competent at. Mm. But for kit bashing, yeah, for whatever reason, sitting down and it's kind of applied to like issues with depression and anxiety and stuff. Um, like after having migraines and stuff, because I've had migraines for years as well. And being able to just sit down and go, I'm going to take this thing that's supposed to look like this, and I'm not stopping until it looks how I want it to look. And being able to filter everything else out, it mm. just sort of reduces. It kind of takes all the things that you're dealing with, either personally or just in the world as a whole, and shunts them off to the side to a really quiet bit where you can't really hear it anymore. And instead, you're just focused on this one task. And like, it's not that far off, I think, the kind of thing that you're supposed to aim for when it comes to like meditation and stuff, mm. kind of just centering down so that you're only focusing on the one thing being you, except it's just focusing on, I don't know, taking, taking a pterogeist and making it have six wings and a bunch of weird candles and stuff all over it. I just kind of, I want this thing to look this way. Nothing else is going to impact for now until mm. that's done like that's just the one thing i'm going to focus on i think it's that action that you kind of just described that also helps the long-term benefits uh how 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 warhammer can help long-term for, for things like anxiety and depression and stuff like that because so i'm not a therapist i'll I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll put that out there so if i get anything wrong here then then you know just give me a bit of grace but um if you're regularly for two hours of, of an evening learning to even subconsciously push those issues to the side, yeah. Um, if you do that for long enough, you start to acknowledge them as other and not as like part of you, I guess. Yeah. So that, I think that's probably where the long term benefits come from more uh, with Warhammer for that stuff as well. It's, it's a good, it's just a good coping mechanism. Like if you're, I've, had like different types of depressive episodes where you can have like um ones that are relatively surface so you can still carry on and function and just do what you need to do day to day um and like building models and painting models helps massively with those it becomes more of a challenge when you get a really bad depressive episode because then that means you don't enjoy anything mm -hmm. but you get, at the same time you don't not enjoy anything either you just end up Kind of floating, floating just through, like just yeah, yeah. It, it just feeling like there's no impact on you from anything mm. in any way, which is more scary, but doesn't tend to last as long for me personally. Mm. But if I'm having like a bad day and I wake up kind of going, oh, this actually feels like the start of something, and I have the space to do it and the time to do it, I will just immediately go to the hobby desk. Mm. I will get a model out that I've been meaning to do something with, and I'll go, you're going to do something with this, and then work on it until either it's done or i suddenly feel that click of oh no actually i'm 
I'm like centered. I'm focused yeah, again now. It's fulfilled its purpose for yeah, that moment. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. It's nice as well because it's one of those things that like, because you can do it on your own or as part of a group, it's kind of this one thing that's always there. It's like this one constant in your life. Like no matter what's, there could be a lot going on with your life. You could be in very, you know, uh, testing times, but like no matter how much change is going on, it's like the one thing that's always there. It's like something you've always got to go back to. It's this like comfort zone, like regular thing. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. Um, you've got a constant to latch on to. It's just, it doesn't matter what else is happening. I've got a few hours, which means I can do this. This is a thing mm -hmm. that is just remained throughout however many years that I know I'm good at, that I know I can get like a, like a level of fulfillment out of as well. I think that's the other thing too. Like it's a hobby where you can come away from it from the end of your evening and going, I'm really happy with that. Mm. Yeah. The accomplishment. And yeah. Yeah, yeah, you feel like you've made something, whether it's building, kit bashing, or painting. You can come away from a session of doing it, and you've got something tangible that you didn't have before that you did, that you like have the proof that you did. Because yeah. I mean, that's that's another thing with, especially with depression, where you kind of feel like you've achieved nothing, even if you've achieved something that day. Um, and just being able to go, well, clearly, because that exists. That wasn't there four hours ago. It's there now. You have irrefutable evidence that you have done something mm. with your with your time so yeah 100 okay well i have a few questions like kind of relating to kit bashing because i am someone who um has enjoyed customizing projects in the past yeah. but has not got really any experience in like some of the great like some of the stuff i see you like even talking about in your videos where you're like oh yeah you know take that get the wings off this get this that and that. just making a new thing because i think um just to lay the groundwork like i think kit bashing and converting and customizing as something that kind of get roped in as one thing. Yeah. But just to separate those things out, to me, kit bashing is taking a whole bunch of different stuff and making one new thing that kind of didn't exist. Yeah. Then you've got the converting, which is, I want this model, uh, but I actually want this other character from like the book. So I'm going to use him as the base and customize him and make him this other guy. And then you've obviously got the customizing, which is like, oh, I've got this regular box of intercessors but i want them to be blood angels so i'm going to put like the cool shoulder pads on and give them some other weapons right so i'm not someone who's done any of the really kit bashing stuff so I, and i presume maybe a lot of our listeners as painters perhaps haven't as well so i want to hear like the pitch for why should someone get into kit bashing what is the what is the pull for me it's it's a mixture of making something that is yours so that if you put it down on the table and you're fighting another army that is maybe the same like the same ostensibly the same force you know exactly which one is which from across the room because you have done enough to properly make them stand out compared to like another army of the same type the the main example for me is the sons of behemoth army that i've got um Technically, there's two of them. But the, one, <laughs> the one I've used the most. Um, I love that for this podcast because we're we're people with we'll be like, oh yeah, that army I'm doing. We we don't mention the fact that I've only painted four models. For it. <laughs> well, the, the the one I've used most is only four models, but I don't. I actually couldn't tell you how many models have gone into building them because um, <laughs> yeah. I really like the actual mega gargan that Games Workshop made. But it, the thing that bugged me about it was the poses felt very similar with like the core of the model being the same and the leg pose being the same on every single one. I, I don't like that on like Chaos Knights or Imperial Knights. And they're a lot easier to mess around with because they're mechanical. So you can like chop and change them and mm. it doesn't really matter because you're not having to like sculpt new skin onto it or something, which I'm still not great at like sculpting green stuff. So when I was looking at doing a Sons of Bearmat army, I was like, I want the army. I just don't want four of this one guy. So is there a way to do that where they could still still like count like proper base size and everything and still be able to say this is what this is, but like make it a bit more of my own? And for whatever reason, I decided to try and do like Lovecraftian, like um almost like Dark Souls-esque monsters. Yeah. Um at no point did I buy a Mega Gargant, which I still think was a mistake, because the tallest one is not quite twice the height of one, but it's not far off, which is stupid because they're already <laughs> tall models. Um, but it was a case of just going, it needs to fit on this size base. It needs to be at least this tall, and I need to be able to put it down and go, that is a Mega Gargant, and people go, fair enough. And so I just ended up trawling through 
like the Games Workshop site and looking at stuff. And I got recommended a recommended a bit of scenery for some reason. I think it was either scenery or it was the Nurgle model that I used as the the base for this thing. Mm. And I'd never been recommended it before. And I didn't know why I was being shown it now because I'd never shown any interest in it previously. But I was like, actually, you know what? If you took that and mixed it with this other thing, could you make something out of that? Like, is that a thing that you could mix together? The idea being some sort of big beast that had a building like growing out of its back. And I decided the only way I would know if that worked would be to buy them and find out. <laughs> Thinking, well, you know, if it doesn't work, I've got scenery and I can make terrain out of it. And I can always use the Nurgle model for just an actual, you know, Nurgle yeah, force yeah. at some point down the line. Um, I like, love how fearless that is. Yeah. Like that's something that I think just the idea of that, I think, would that is, be enough to put people off. That is a Warhammer, that is hobbyist maths at its best. Oh, well, the only way, I better buy the models, yeah. better find out. A lot of my kit bashes start out like that. It's just literally, could I do? And then the answer is, well, I won't know until I try. <laughs> um, that's what, like, and that's what that ended up as. Oh, so, okay. What is that from? What is that from? <laughs> that this is also another thing. thing. That kind of reaction, I, I get. I get a real kick that. out of. Um, yeah. What is that from? That's Blowab Rotsborn on the bottom. So it's an AOS uh, oh, Nova right. model. It doesn't look right because I haven't used the front legs. I've used two sets of back legs. Yeah, I was going to say, am I looking at the back. back or the front? Yeah, and it's also the body is upside down because if you turn the body upside down, there's a cavity where you can just I mean, about get if you the scenery that, in. If you put that down in front of me and said, that is a Gargan, I would go, fair enough. Yeah, fair play. I would go, it's, yeah, like, absolutely. it's the right base size. That's the other, so. the other side of it is like, if it's something that looks so cool, like no one's going to have gonna a problem care? with it. Like, well, that's yeah, sick. I would nice. much yeah. rather be looking at this. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. That is the one thing that I found, especially with that army, is nine times out of 10, it's a case of, here's what each of these are. Here's a piece of paper that also says what they are because I realize it's confusing because they don't look like, they do look like things that Games Workshop sells in that they look like I've taken a bunch of things they sell and put them together. <laughs> but like, you're not going to look at that and immediately go, oh, that's a war stomp. Like, you're just not going to yeah, think that. Yeah. Um, so when I've taken them to events, I've had a sheet that has like what each one is, like a picture of it, that's what it courteous. is. That's yeah. like that. Yeah. Like yeah. How many points it is, yeah. which one is like the general so that they know which one is, you know, like, I guess the most important kind of thing. Um, That's very sportsmanly. I was just, Ooh, yeah. I just feel like if you're going to show up with something like as heavily can like kit bashed, you've got to do like all you can to make you've, sure. Yeah. No you've got to, yeah, yeah, you've got to like take into consideration like something that I don't like the idea of is is going up against someone and then putting a bunch of stuff down and going, this looks like this, but it's not actually that. It's something totally different, and I'm only going to explain this once, and then you just have to remember. Yeah, I'm not. I, I've experienced that like twice and it was like way, way back both times. And it was the same guy both times, funnily enough. <laughs> but like I'm always very conscious of if I'm gonna if I'm gonna rock up with something that looks so different to what it's supposed to be or what it started out as, it's it's not fair to expect someone to just remember or just guess. So I need to make sure that they have the information so that the game can go like smoothly and they're not having to go. What's what's the guy with like eight wings? Is that? <laughs> <laughs> Me going, yeah, that's just another mega gargan because you know. <laughs> Equally though, how what a way to set the tone at the start of your game? You're like you put your crazy models on the table and you hand them like a laminated sheet. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, oh god, no. <laughs> what's I'm curious then. So what's like what's the hit rate then on successes? Because I I've got to imagine that if you just go, I don't know if this is going to work. Let's find out. You must have had some like fairly significant failed attempts yeah. right yeah sure. I, i've had a few that have just been bad and i've just kind of <laughs> taken the components and gone i'll use this for something else another day like there's nothing i can do with it right now um do you get like is it does it vary like do you try to see it through until the end and then decide later is it like a trust the process thing or do sometimes you yeah. just like no nah, let's cut this while i'm ahead it tends to be like a trust the process thing because there's there's a point in any like really big kit bash especially where it just kind of looks like a mess. Like you've got kind of bits of different models that are blue tacked on and they don't quite look like they're going to fit. And you know, there's going to be, have to be a ton of like green stuff work and, and pinning and things to make it work. And there's always a point where you kind of look at it and go, I should have just bought the thing because <laughs> this is going to be a disaster. And I know it's going to be a disaster, but if I push through just a little bit more, I might reach the point where I suddenly go, okay, that is working. Um, it's to be fair, I think 
the failures that I've had have just been quite severe where the idea has just not gone anywhere, where it's been no matter what combination of things I've tried, it's just not worked. The rest of them I've either pushed through or I've found another way to in, like to implement whatever it was. Like the first tank that I did for my armored company um, is now just a, a Imperial Guard tank. I say just an Imperial Guard tank. It's covered in other stuff as well. Um, <laughs> of <but> course. <laughs> it kind of has to be. Um, but that initially was supposed to be like a mobile um, like stage for an Empress Children Army. So I built it initially to have the stats of a of a Bane blade, but have a big like stage on the back with speakers, and there's going to be <laughs> there's going to be like uh, noise marines that yeah. were playing on it, and I could not find a way to make it work. I just did not like any kind of version of it that I came up with, and I got through so many like panels of scenery and stuff before I just I just decided it. I don't know why I can't do this. I'm sure someone else could, and I've seen other people do similar things that work really well but I just couldn't get what I wanted out of it. Mm. So I shelved it for years. And then I randomly saw a piece of art and took one look at it and went, I want to make that. I want to make that in 40K or something similar to that. I have a Bane blade that's like half assembled. I could probably do that now if I wanted to. So I went and dug it out of the box it was in. And then that same day, I made that first tank for the armored company and then decided... Well, now I need a whole load of these. <laughs> so I, I'd better get working on more tanks for this. Um, it, quite a few of them kind of happen like that, where it will just be a case of having an idea, seeing a thing or reading something and just going, I think I could make like my version of whatever this is. Mm. And then hoping that it, hoping that it works, <laughs> which yeah, mostly, most of the time it does. It's just, when it doesn't, it is very much a case of lots of hours of sitting there trying things and going, that's still no, that's a shame. Okay, <laughs> we're going to have to. <laughs> I guess if it's not working, because it's your creation, it's quite easy to adjust on the fly and, oh, maybe this should be different or maybe I'll, I've thought that, but maybe not or something like that, that. That happens quite a bit where I've had models where I've had an idea going in, got partway through and thought, I don't know if that's going to work, but I think maybe this will instead. Mm. Um, where it's it's kind of ended up being better than the original idea. Um, like another another one of the Mega Gargants was initially not going to have uh, this. I, I need to see this for what did you say? There's four of them. <laughs> yes, there's four. So I can't imagine anyone if, if you, you rocked up to if a you tournament swipe with left, that. it will go through the go through the. Let's four. have a look. Right. So like wow. A, okay. So, so that's <laughs> a biblically accurate angel. Was the idea behind that? Yeah, these are crazy. I haven't actually seen these before. They're very these over are the top. wild. They're very cool though. I could, this is probably you asked for a good advertisement on why you should kit bash your arm. I think this is probably a good. Uh, <laughs> you should you should have just you could have made this a lot shorter. You could have just shown me this. <laughs> yeah, this you, should have, <laughs> you should have just completely ignored George. Just if you're flashed up if you're listening to this episode on Spotify, please head over to to YouTube and you can see these models uh, that are on screen. I love the, that the they viewers. still. They look like a cohesive army. That, that was the biggest challenge. They look I, like they are. They don't look like four separate. Things. You know what I mean? I yeah, know a lot of that yeah. comes down to the painting, but even like you can tell. Like I couldn't paint a uh, uh, something. Like I couldn't paint like a Skaven thing and a Space Marine all in Dark Angels colors. And so yeah, they're both Dark Angels. Like it would look weird. Yeah. So uh, that was a big. That's probably a challenge with it. It was a case of finishing them and then going. How do I make this into one? Force. Like, how do you take yeah, was that four like things a, that are totally different? And when you're building, are you building each one? So those four, are you building each one to completion, and then moving yes. on to the next one? Yeah. So it, is there an active thought process on? Oh, I need to tie it into the previous one. Oh no, not even slightly. <laughs> like it was each one of them was like, I've got an idea, and then I I did the idea, and then I went, I've got another idea, and then I did that idea, and then I had all four of them, and then I put them on the desk in front of me and went. What the hell is this? Like, how am I gonna? How are you gonna make this look like one army? The to all of them are totally different. No two of them have like. I mean, it looks fairly cohesive. Yeah, I mean, to you me, killed like, it on the paint job because yeah. they definitely look cohesive. It yeah. was, it was really. It took so long to come up with a paint job that I liked on them because I would try something on one, try it on the other, and go, "Well, it looked alright on on that guy, but it doesn't look good on this one because the like the skin's a totally different texture, or there's a lot more like." 
There's a lot more detail in different places. Um, and in the end, I just got very close to needing them to be finished. Mm. Um, the way I generally finish painting armies is being told this needs to be done in two weeks to go to a tournament or a battle report. <laughs> Are you done? And me going, no. Uh, okay, let's go. We need to do this now. We need to pick something and stick with it because we've got to do it now. I did the same thing with um, Soul Blight Grave Lord's Army, which again is is pretty much all either kit bashed or has had like customization done to it, where it was the first time I was playing AOS since the first edition of the game. I'd played it once when it launched and then hadn't played it again. And then um, I was invited to go to Face Hammer and I had the army and I assembled it and painted it in like a couple of months up to the actual date of it. And I didn't know what to do like paint scheme wise for that either. Mm. And I, I think I finished painting that the day before I <laughs> left because it was just a case of, I can't think of a good scheme for this. There's wolves, there's dragons, there's zombies. <laughs> there's like, you know, there's like Radicar the Beast, a great model, but I'd, I'd like customized him. So he had like a skeletal horse's head instead of his head. <laughs> and I'd given him an ax and stuff and taken certain aspects of the base away. And it was just a case of going, you need to pick something right now because if you don't paint it now, you can't take it with you because you can't show up with a non-painted army to a tournament. So we're going to go for a kind of muted brown with really vibrant blues and see if that works. <laughs> and I got like halfway through the army and went, I'm glad this is working because it would be a real <laughs> shame if, I, if it didn't at this point. We had um, we had Arbiter Ian on a previous episode as guest and he said a similar thing actually of like his biggest motivator for painting was a deadline that was his his answer for I it i feel like that's where we're going wrong we're not signing up to any tournaments or anything <laughs> maybe so that, so we just never end up we have no nothing to show for it yeah if even, anything if anything to do the opposite it's like i'll probably have this done in three months yeah and then three months six months come and go and i'm like ah well you know it'll be that, done when it's done yeah that's kind of where the armored company was at until i took them to do a battle report with liam dempsey it yeah. was like that project is like three and a half years long by that point where I just, every now and again, I go, I fancy building a tank. And so I built a tank. I started out with an army list and the rules had changed so significantly by the time it was done that I needed like more points. Mm. Like I just needed more tanks in mm. there because the old list was too small because like you're not charged for sponsors and stuff. So I had to buy more stuff. And all the way through it, I was like, I should really knuckle down and get this army finished. I really need to <laughs> get it sorted. And then finally, <laughs> Liam reached out and was like, we're going to record something. We're going to do battle report. What are you bringing with you? And I was like, oh, uh, <laughs> oh no. Um, tanks? And he's like, okay, cool. Are they ready to go? I was like, no. <laughs> and that was about three weeks before I was due to go. And so I finished building and painting those tanks in like two weeks before, before going there. <laughs> they wouldn't be done. If I hadn't yeah, had the deadline, yeah. they was would that the still most be. Recent time going to live? Yeah, or was that another time? That was, that the most, was most recent. recent. Yeah, like cool. the 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 Bane Blade was done literally three and a half years ago or something, and the rest <laughs> of the army was sort of. I started out really kind of frenzied and like this is the new project, but I just got distracted with doing like the Mega Gargants, and then I ended up doing another Sons of Bayamat army that was based around some like another kit, um, and I just ended up kind of going, yeah, I'll get around to it. Yeah, I'll get around to it. Yeah, I'll get around to it. <laughs> Oh no, I need them now. You need them now, you say. Okay, great. Let's let's try and sort that immediately because ooh. Um the the biggest distraction I had was stuff that I didn't even know what it was whilst I was building it, which was these guys. That there's oh, wow. eight, nine of them now. That's slightly out of date. There's only I think it's left or it's left or right, but that's another Sons of Bayamas army where I for no reason whatsoever, I had a box of the, the Necromunda Ambots lying around. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know why. I thought, they're cool how they are. What if you stacked the legs? Because you get two sets of legs for each Ambot. Okay. Depending on the pose. Can you put one set of legs under the other set of legs to make them like lanky and tall? Yeah. And I did it and then was like, okay, cool. You can do that why what would you even use this for and <laughs> at the time i was like writing stuff for a dnd campaign and i liked the idea of kind of armored suits that were both magically powered and like technology powered at the same time mm. um 
And so I just delved into the bits box and found fantasy esque things, more like steampunk looking stuff. I was going to say um, that's kind of the vibe that I'm get the steampunk yes, looking someone stuff. Someone pointed out I basically getting. made the stuff from War Machine. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I see that. Which I have. Oh, it is kind of similar actually yeah, to those. I like... hadn't twigged at all. I was just like, I've made these things and I don't know what they are. And someone went, "You've made war jacks." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's... well, multi-purpose then. Yeah, you can, uh, <laughs> yeah. <multiple> games <laughs> yeah. yeah. Have you got a favorite character from a book or piece of artwork and thought to yourself, if only that had a miniature? Custom Service is our character creation brand here at Siege Studios. Custom Service is not just a kit bash. We create miniatures using traditional hand sculpting alongside conversion for entirely unique and bespoke miniatures that will blow you away. Our talented team of sculptors methodically and meticulously bring your thoughts into reality with the precise, refined and sharp work you'd expect from a digital sculpt and pair that with our world-class painting team for an incredible display piece you'll be proud to own. To bring your character to life and get a quote now, head to siegestudios.co.uk or head to the link in this episode's description. What's your relationship like with painting then? So let's say like tournaments and such and deadlines aside, is painting for you something that um, is an obstacle because you enjoy the kit bashing so much? Or is it something that, do you find it as therapeutic as the build? Like, is it something that you can actually just sit down and enjoy? Or is it something that you have to get through? Because I hear from a lot of painters, oh, I hate the building. I just want to get that done so I can actually knuckle down and paint. And then I often hear, there's so many people that I can think of that just love converting and kit bashing models and they never paint them. Like yeah, that's, yeah. they're like, oh, done on the shelf. It goes. We've had clients like it where like, they're like, I've got all these models that I've built. I've no interest in painting them. Like, yeah. Um, oh, I, I still have to like drum up enthusiasm for painting, but I enjoy it whilst I'm doing it. Like a big part of it is actually feeling like I can paint now because for the longest time it was a case of, I need to get a certain number of colors on this. So it looks like I've done it and that's about all I can manage. <laughs> and I think I'd probably convince myself that I just wasn't good enough at painting to warrant trying to get better, mm. which is, you know, that, that there's probably a whole, you know, not going to do yourself any favors. No, with that they, process. that's probably a whole therapy session right there. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was just a case of, well, I have to paint it to use it. So I guess I need to paint it. Now, now that I've got a bit better with it and I enjoy it more and I kind of know what I'm doing a bit more and I can consistently get the type of result that I want mm. um, instead of like getting a poor result and going, well, I would never be able to do better than that anyway. Now I can actually go, I want this to look like this. And most of the time it'll end up being like how I want it. So I still have to kind of force myself to do it, but then I enjoy it when I'm doing it. Still not quite as much as like kit bashing, a lot of that, though, is probably down to I don't do anything in sub assemblies because everything's kit bashed. Yeah. <laughs> so everything is just one big mess of parts. Yeah. Like the the angel that I did for the the mega gargons was awful to paint because it's so just like little spindly little bits to get inside. Yeah. It's just like a ton of different parts, like glued and green stuff together, and there is no real easy way to approach any part of it. It's just like. That was a chore, but it's only a chore because I made it that way myself. So there's like, I'll get points where I'll kind of get partway through painting something I made and go, this was a terrible idea. Why <laughs> did you do it this way? You idiot. You should have done something more simple. Like, what? okay, it's fine. I'm just going to push through and then I'll reach a point and go, this is working. This looks good. Yeah. I'm happy with this. This is this is fine. I'm enjoying it again. But there's there's usually a point where I'm like, I have brought this on myself and I'm not happy about it. <laughs> so did you find that you just needed the confidence boost of a little bit of practice then to kind of get over that hump? Because I hear yeah. from a lot of the community yeah. like, oh, I'm scared to paint this because I don't think I'm good enough yet. And they kind yes. of have these like, you know, centerpiece characters that they never want to touch. And I think that they kind of end up just keep kicking the can. And it's like, if you never actually yeah. get that paint down, you're never actually going to learn that skill. So you kind of got to just, I don't want to say just get over it, but you've got to <laughs> just actually give yeah. it a go and get like, Everyone always says like your first few models or like the first ones we're really trying hard, they're not necessarily going to be great. But once you've got those out of the way and you've learned the fundamentals and you can start moving on from it, then that's when the reward starts coming in. Yeah, that's kind of, I, I'd sort of put myself in a corner where I just decided that I couldn't do things, not necessarily because I hadn't tried, but because I didn't think it would work if I did. Mm. So it's just a case of there's no point trying to learn to blend because I can't do it. And it wasn't, it was literally a point of um, uh, Byron from Artis Opus reaching out years ago and going, 
I want to send you some brushes. I want to send you some some dry brushes. See what you think of them. Like, okay, I'm not the person to do this. But <laughs> I'm not good at this. And he went, no, no, use them. I will come and like help and show you how to use them, and you will be able to do it. And I was like, I'll give them a try, but. At the time, I thought there's no way he can go around to everybody and teach them how to use these. So it it's not necessarily a fair interpretation of it or like view of it. Yeah. If I get like a class before I make a video, instead I should just take them, take the instructions, take a model that I was intimidated about painting because of the just amount of detail and mm. stuff on it. It was a model with like a big like feathery wings that I'd I never think, tried I, before. I feel like I remember this video. Yeah. A few years ago, right? It must have yes, been like it was a while three, ago. Three, four years, maybe when they were just doing the, the I think it might have been a, for the first yeah. time or something. I think it was maybe the first run of them. Mm. Um, but I just took that model and it, like looking back at it now, and kind of, I've gone back and watched it and I've gone, I'm getting so excited about like the most basic, but like the most basic, not that good blending. <laughs> but up until that video, I couldn't do that. It was just a case of I never knew how to do it. I didn't really know where to, like, how to start in learning it. Mm. On the rare occasion, I had some of the courage to try and look it up. I would look at what, like, the end result and go, well, I won't be able to do that. And then just giving up on it. And then for for that video, it was like, well, I've got to try these. I'm going to see if they work. And if I can get something passable out of this, then anyone can. Mm. Um, did the video immediately. It was like, Wait, so you can't you can actually wait, you can actually paint? You can paint, you can do that? Okay. I should try and do more of this. And just went through this phase of painting all the stuff that I was too scared to paint before. Yeah. Um, then I went through a massive phase of just painting cloaks because I couldn't paint cloaks before because I just did one like really awful, like thick base coat and then went and wash. Done. <laughs> Done. That looks kind of like their shadows in the right places. I'm sure that's fine. Um, and then kind of realizing that, no, you can build up highlights and you can actually create shadows and it can actually look like a piece of cloth and not like someone slapped a load of paint on something. Um, and like that was the turning point of, I only paint because I can't show up with unpainted models to, if I want to paint something, I can, which immediately turns it from that kind of chore and the thing that you just dread doing mm. to, no, this is enjoyable now. Yeah, now it's a that complete like, it. mindset shift, yeah. isn't it? One thing yeah. that I find interesting there is that uh, previously, like we said before, learning all of this, is that you said with the kit bashing stuff, you're like, will this work? Don't know, I'm just going to give it a go. But you didn't apply that same no. thought process to the painting. And it's like, you weren't born knowing how to kit bash stuff. You had to learn that, right? <laughs> it's and, so hypocritical. Like, it's <laughs> such, a, such a weird distinction to make. It's just well, I think like, a lot of people do that with, with the hobby in itself. It's like, for example, like I said, oh, I haven't done the kit bashing stuff. And I know that that's part internally because like, I don't know how to do that. And I know it's going to look terrible because I haven't done it before. But yes. it's like the exact inverse of what you're talking about. It's like, well, I, ha I have to give it a go yeah. to actually know if it's something I can do or not. Yeah. And inevitably, it's a skill I'm going to have to learn. But like you said, anyone can do it at the end of the day. Yeah. I mean, something that I, I try and do fairly frequently is to take something that I've got left over from another kit and put it on the desk and go you need to use this. That's quite a, I think that's quite a good way to kind of get yourself used to kit bashing and getting used to like, I guess like taking big swings and kind of going, I'm not sure what to do here, but there's something, there's like a, a foundation that I could probably build something off. And if I don't do something with it, it's just going to sit there forever and I'm not going to use any of it. Like the, the monster that's got the column growing out of the back and the columns coming out the side, that's from an Ossiarch Bone Reapers scenery kit that mm. also has two sets of stairs, which without the columns, it's just, you can't <laughs> use them for anything at all. And I remember sitting down one day going, no, you're going to use those. They're really big. I don't know what you would do with them, but you just need to do something because they're taking up a bunch of space and they're like half the value of that kit. Make something. And I ended up turning them into like a floating prison with like chains hanging off them. I didn't have yeah. an idea for what to do when I sat down with them. I just held them, put them together, <laughs> moved them around a bit and went, it's a big gap in the middle. I reckon, could you do like a big floating prison cell? Would that work? Would that be fun? That could be fun. And even as I was thinking, I was like, it's a weird leap to make, but that's the only thing I could think of at the time. And so I just decided, I'll just try it. 
I'll just try See, it. That that cre- that like creativity spark thing is the bit that I'm missing from it. I think because yeah. I'll just look at the parts for like two hours and I'll be like, just looks like that, stairs to me. I don't know. I don't but know. That must do. come from the experience, I suppose. Like I said, I guess. I, yeah, I would imagine. Yeah. That's like what that ended up. See, being. I could never. I couldn't. Yeah, I, I couldn't mean, like. You're just showing off now. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't get, come to that conclusion. Like that from, was the main bit, trying to make it look like it was hovering. I don't. Yeah. Think it, so I, is that all just connected as one piece, and it's all just kind of balancing on it's this? It's got a little. It's got a little brass rod in the bottom that goes into the scenery at the base, right? Uh, that kind of holds it in place, and then a strategically placed bush to. to yeah. Because. <laughs> I didn't know how else I was going to do that. Um, so having like, aside from having a bunch of kits in front of you that you can turn into your playground, where is where does the inspiration come from then? So say someone's listening to this episode, they want to give this a go, they've heard what you're saying, but they haven't got a big collection of bits and stuff. Where is it you start looking for inspiration for these sorts of projects? For me, that kind of just comes from just random places. So like like the the... Mega Gargants, which are kind of like supposed to be cosmic horror style, almost like Dark Souls esque. Um, one of them was a case of I can't remember where I saw it or, or heard it, but there was it was either a thread or a video about kind of the fact that angels are represented weirdly in media compared to how they are in like actually the Bible. So in media, it's just a bloke with wings and a halo, and you know they're wearing a white sheet, and that's it. <laughs> and how in the Bible it talks about you know like a bunch of concentric circles covered in eyes and stuff, or there'll be one giant eyeball with nine wings and things. And like they're really weird, like really, really odd. And reading or like hearing about that and going, I mean, the, the Stormcast have got like angelic like stuff to them. I think it's the Lord Sacrosanct has got these big, very stylized wings. Mm. Um, maybe there's something that could be done with, with that maybe. And then remembering I had the big, like, there's a big, like, chaos orb that comes off the back of one of the chaos models. Um, I think it's the Mutalith Vortex Beast. It's got this big chaos star oh, coming the off the back, about, yeah. um, which is the central part of that angel where oh, I, okay. I kind of had the idea of, well, what if you took all of it? So you had the guy. He can be underneath the giant eye. The eye's got a bunch of wings around it, and I need a way to tie the eye to the actual person because mm. i can't just have like a gigantic head on a normal body that would look really weird um and i found a bunch of almost spear like i think it's from a aos scenery kit a bunch of sort of spears sticking out so i use those to support the eye coming out of the neck of the sacrosanct and put it all together and went that's not what i was initially aiming for but it's close enough. The inspiration got me to the idea of like, what about this part from this kit? What about this part from that kit? Mm. And the execution is maybe not what I was initially going for, but it kind of gets the idea across and it does look horrifying. And that's kind <laughs> yeah. of what I was going for. Yeah. So it's it's kind of close enough. Um, it's really just anything that kind of makes you sit there and go, oh, it'd be cool to see that in plastic. Or yeah. it would be cool to see that on the tabletop. So I get it when I leave. Well, for some reason, specifically when I leave in the, the cinema after seeing something. Yes. Not watching a film at home. I don't know what it is. Just the cinema. I don't know what it is. Like, but like Maybe the scale of it. Yeah. Like having just it seen larger than life. And I think, you know, when you're in the cinema, you're watching something. I, I'm quite good for even at home. If I'm watching a film, I'm watching a film, the phone's down kind of thing. But. There's distractions and stuff at home, isn't there? Whereas if you're watching something in the cinema and you're locked in on it, the ideas start flowing. And I'm like, oh, that'd be a cool model. Oh, oh really? That's wonder interesting. That, that might look, obviously, specifically like sci-fi stuff or whatever, yeah, like yeah, more, yeah. more often than not. I'll be like, oh, it'd be cool if there was a model that looked like that. Or, oh, that reminds me of this model. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. That kind of thing. I get that yeah. for, um, I don't necessarily get that for like the creation of models, but from like a painting side of things, I'll often see that when there's like, um, really atmospheric lighting or just like a really cool color palette mm. that I can find inspiration from. But I've never been like watching, you well, know, Mad good, Max like, and thought, ah, yeah. orc. <laughs> I was going to say like, oh, good, good example of like rust or weathering yeah. or something. Yeah. You see that and you're like, yeah. oh, I wish I could take a picture of that. Yeah. I mean, Fury Road is like the ultimate thing of every, oh, time, of course, every yeah. time I watch that, I'm like, I just want to make an orc army. <laughs> yeah. I just want to do that. That's all I want now. So as you've been doing this for like quite a number of years, have you found with the way that GW kits are sort of starting to progress into being 
I think because the sculpts are so much more dynamic now, the models are getting like almost more specific. Mm. Have you found that, you know, because everyone talks about how like, oh, the, you know, Space Marines kits aren't like the old tactical Marines where you could pose them. Have you found that like- That's just... a very good James impression. Exactly. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have you found though that like, uh, you know, leaking into other kits and the kit bashing and stuff, have you found it like more difficult as time's gone on to kit bash stuff? Just because I'm thinking like in my head, when you see a part now, it's not uncommon for it to have like five or six other random parts become a part of it, if that makes sense. So I just draw it on Marines again. Like often a Marine now will be like the tabard and the knee pad and a shoulder is one <laughs> yeah. piece. And you're yeah. like, what do I do with that? You know yeah. what I mean? It, it's definitely got, especially with like smaller miniatures, it's got a lot harder. Like I think to to do like, do full full on conversions and really kind of go overboard with kit bashing. You actually need to be able to not just put miniatures together, but be able to sculpt stuff now. Yeah, which is something I'm still quite lacking at. So tackling smaller models is it's now actually more of a problem than doing big stuff. Like when it comes to things like Chaos Knights and Imperial Knights, it's quite easy to repose them if you want to. You know, you can chop them up at the at the hip or at the knee, and there's bits that you can print or you can make to kind of change the shape of the legs. All that kind of thing is actually really comparatively simple, even though you wouldn't think it would be, just because of the scale of the model. It's mm -hmm. like, well, that should be more complex. But then, yeah, you, you get you get some of the some of the like HQ models specifically, and it's like, I want to make this into something totally different. And then you, you look at the sprue, and it's just like two complete halves but with weird shapes all through the middle. And one of the arms is also the foot and the head is <laughs> the other leg. And it it just becomes a case of, if I want to use the bits from this that I want, I need to like carve them off the miniature mm. to be able to put them on something else, which a lot of the time just, it might be doable, but it's not going to be as much fun. Yeah, And there's a lot, there's a big like decrease in just, like loads of extras and stuff like things like mm. the um specifically with the the blood angels box they they announced things like the old the old blood angels death company kit which i know they still make that's just got so much ornamentation and stuff and not mm. all of it is like fully attached to the miniatures and the bits that are you can still like mix and match that with other kits yeah. if you want to do. Well, because a... when when you're done, there's leftover parts, right? It's not like there's 20 dudes in here and we've given you 20 accessories. Yes, yeah. same with Stone Guard. The yeah. old Stone yeah. Guard kit was one of the best kits for Space Marine players because of how many extras you got. You got a bunch of extra weapons. You got a bunch of extra detail. There were loads of different like shoulder pads and stuff. So that if you wanted to make your entire like, you could make two tactical squads, fairly varied and a lot fancier mm. than they would otherwise have been with one box of stone guard and the new ones just don't have any of that like there's mm. there's such a lack of parts compared to the old kit and it's kind of it feels like this mix of making everything a bit more streamlined especially space marines everything is a bit more streamlined it's a bit less decorative when it comes to the special units and it's a lot harder to get those parts off unless it is a designated parts box. Yeah. So like, I know there's ones for Dark Angels and Blood Angels and Black Templars. Those are really good boxes because you get all the different weapons and stuff. But just the base kits, there's like a total lack of that now almost. I, I would actually say that, so I've started a Space Marines army recently. It's the first army I've ever started for myself. Yeah. And from the way people talk about it, I understand that there's not as much customization and extra bits as there used to be. And that's a perfectly fair criticism. However... I think by the way people talk about it, I almost went into it assuming that there'd just be like nothing left at the end of it. And there's actually a pretty surprising amount of spare parts still left with the Primaris kits. Like the Intercessors, you've got loads of extra like bits and pieces and poses and arms and stuff. And once you put a few of those kits together, you have actually got a surprising amount of uh, room to play with, like at least like extra heads and shoulder pads and like, you know, accessories and whatnot. Mm. Um, I think it's almost like we're spoilt before. Yeah. Like you're so yeah. spoilt with what you could get out of any given box that even though options might not be bad now, just got so used to having... It was taken away from us. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a case of, it's not bad, but it's just not as much. And once you've got used to there being all this stuff, the lack of it suddenly feels like it's like a bigger impact. Mm. It's interesting because there's, there's obviously a business decision for this, but... It feels weird that upgrade sprues aren't more of a thing currently. Like people would buy like, 
I'm not just talking about the Space Marine upgrade sprues or anything like any kind of upgrade sprue. Like if there was hundreds of different ones, like people would buy them. Do they do kits for other factions? Because I know obviously they do the ones for the Marines, but it's not like you can go out and buy like a Stormcast upgrade sprue. No, but potentially like I'm looking at, for example, how they're doing all the kill team boxes now. The kill yes. team boxes are here's a kit and here's an upgrade sprue. Yeah. But those kind of upgrade sprues, like even if you mix and match, like you did. A, oh, here's a Xenos upgrade sprue, and it's just loads of different parts to do with Xenos or something like that. I feel like that, like everyone would love it, and especially when you would imagine that GW are probably trying to combat 3D printing and 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 things like that. There must be a reason why it's not around, and it's probably just a small priority, or, or it's not that important to them. But well, we have seen with again, I know it's Marines, but we have start to see that like the new upgrade kits coming out with these big boxes and stuff. So like, obviously we had. Black Templars, what was that last year? And then start of this year, we had Dark Angels, now we've had Blood Angels. So it does it does seem pretty obvious that that's the way they're going to go with the other factions and whatnot. Yeah. So I wonder if once they've ticked all of those boxes, if they'll start going, okay, let's do Chaos Space Marines or okay, let's do, mm. you know, Tau. Yeah, potentially. It just feels like, yeah, that's something that is it's such a talking point all the time. People want cool, unique, like, transfers to pick from and cool, unique extra parts to pick from. Like, they would make so much money. Yeah, like, it's yeah. interesting. I think they did push quite hard into making things just a bit more approachable and a bit simpler yeah. for a while. Yeah, And I think they're kind of expanding back out. Like, it, it kind of... Things like how the, how the Intercessor squads and stuff handle weapons compared to, like, tactical squads, just there being, you have a gun and they all have that gun and that's that's it there's no like there's no there's no choice of like you can take a missile launcher as well or you can take a plasma gun the melt gun the sergeant can have this that and the other mm. it feels like they kind of leaned into making things a lot more kind of you pick up the box and you build the guys as they are in the front of the box and you don't need to think about the rest of it but it does now feel like they've kind of gone that's stripping away quite a lot of the like customization and the personalization mm. of I the can understand things. I can understand why they lean into that as yeah. their thing but I think it would be cool if the other stuff was still there behind the scenes for anyone that digs far enough so right. yeah they absolutely have it so that you can just buy it build it build them as they are on the box it's really easy to understand people like me would prefer that I, I that's what I tend to do because I just find oh, I'm not going to mess up here because I'm just this is how it's supposed to be yeah. you know what I mean um, but yeah having that other stuff that you're talking about still present would be nice. I guess I, I love the idea of it being like aesthetically customizable, but rule wise, everything's kind of one and the same. Cause like what put yeah. me off for so long, like I'm someone who's been in, in the hobby, like painting for, I guess like six years or so. And up until like, I've painted, it must be over 2000 models now, like commissions, armies, like you name it. But I'd never picked up the game ever because every single time I got a bit of an itch to try, I'm like, oh, there's all these rules I've got to read and I've got to come up with a list and I don't know what's good and I haven't got like a friend who can, you know, hold my hand and walk me through it and explain it all to me. Yeah. I always found it really, really complicated. And what actually gave me the courage to pick it up and give it a go now, while I'm still probably like two years out, let's be honest, of actually finishing anything, having it ready. I was going to pull you up earlier because you said you recently decided yeah, to yeah. start a Blood Age. It's been a while. It's been a while. <laughs> it has literally been this year at least. Yeah, I it's think. been like six months. Yeah. But as myself, as a, a filthy casual, I like the idea that I can... <laughs> You know, just pick up this like PDF online and there's all the models and here's how many points they are. And I yep. can just build them however I want. That's, yeah. that's, how, that's how they should just do things the whole time. I'll, I'm going to keep banging the drum of make the rules free, instantly accessible, stripped down so that it's just a case of if you want all the lore, you buy a book. And then if you want to play the game, you can just do that. Yeah. Because that's the lowest like that... The barrier to entry being you have to have a book that is going to be out of date two weeks after you buy it to then know what you're going to do with the stuff that you want to buy from them. Still, is for me, it's like the way they've done like Spearhead for AOS, um, for the, the new version of AOS, mm. I feel like that should just be how they do everything, where it is just here are all the rules. This is how you play it. These are the rules for all the units. This is how you play them. Now go and buy the stuff. Yeah. yeah, I so many people I know weren't that interested in Spearhead, and then Games Workshop went, "Oh, and all the rules are free," and they went, "Oh, wait, I can just get <laughs> wait, I don't need to buy. I can just get into it. I can just like look at it, decide whether I want to try it, and then buy a box and build it." 
that's all I need to do. Yeah, I mean, that is it as well. The money, the money's still going to be spent. Let's be real. Like the money yeah. I was going to spend on the book, I am just going to buy more models. Yeah, like, yeah. You're still going to yeah. get my money. Don't yeah. worry. Hundred like, yeah. percent. I, a friend of mine, never just not interested in AOS, wasn't that bothered by it. Like hardcore forty k in Horus Heresy, and then literally last week he played a game of AO, of uh, of Spearhead, and then he immediately messaged me and went, which which spearhead boxes should I buy? And I was like, what do you mean boxes? And he boxes. was like, well, I, I don't want to just have one army because it's like quite a small, short game mode. I want to be able to have a bit of variety. And it's like, well, I mean, it depends on what you like, for like what you're interested in. And he was just like, well, I want all of them, but I can't buy all of them straight away. So which three? And I'm just like, this is someone who didn't care. They weren't going to buy the general's handbook. They weren't going to buy the big box that Games Workshop came out with. They weren't interested in the starter kit or anything like that. Yeah. But they literally got told, take a look at these rules. Does this look fun? They said yes, tried it, and now they're fully invested in what is just a smaller version of AOS. Like, really, that's all it is. Mm. And, you know, I feel like if you could do that with every single, every single, like, um, system mm. just go oh you're interested in 40k here's all the free rules here's what you need for your army here's like you know 500,000 2,000 points decide what you want to do and go from there make things so much easier mm. just lower ev- just lower the barrier of 100%. entry way down is 100%. it like similar to combat patrol in that respect or is it's... combat patrol like was combat patrol a bit different because it was literally like this is the you can't even decide. Well, that was, that was the idea with 10th with Combat Patrol, right? Yeah. It was supposed to be this box that you buy and then that's your 500 points, yes. right? Yes. They, but they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Spearhead is a lot more polished. Okay. I'll put it that yeah. way. It's a lot more Do you think polished. they learned from 100%. what happened with yeah. Combat I, Patrol? I think, I think they, they had a good idea with Combat Patrol, but I don't think they, I don't think they got the execution how they wanted it necessarily. Um, but with AOS, they they seem to have a very, very clear idea of what they wanted to do going in, which was to, at least when you start out, it's the same game whether you're using, um, there's two different realms. So you've got like the realm of life and the realm of fire, and there's cards related to what happens on the, on the battlefield. And there's still an element of chance. So you still have things that happen each turn that can affect like different players differently. Like the underdog might have a bonus going into the next round because of something that's happened on the cards. They've introduced a proper system of being able to choose between getting like a command point or using a special ability. Mm. Like it feels very, very tight and focused. And I've had quite a few games of it now. And the the main force that I've used is a Sons of Bearmat force, which when I, the first one that we played- What do they look like? <laughs> oh, they they just they're supposed to look like normal giants, but those are the like metal guys that I showed you before. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, but like I I played it for the first time on launch weekend. I went to an event that Hellstorm Wargaming hosted. Mm. And going in, everyone was really worried about Sons of Bayama because you've got three like man crusher gargons and two of them come back. Like can be like revived and brought back onto the battlefield. Yeah, so, I love these little these wonky rules like this where you when someone's got one where it's like ah oh, and it comes back. It's always like an extra thing to think. This about. is this is one of the things where going in, everyone went. I don't think they need that. I <laughs> I don't want to fight your army. I actually don't want to fight it. And then the first game I had, one of the first things we agreed on was yeah, they do need that. They actually need it. Like they have thought it through. It seems broken and overpowered, but you've only got three models. Mm. everyone else has got multiple units, like quite a few units of 10, or there'll be a unit of three, and then a few units of one. You've got three guys who are really good at standing on objectives, but there's still only three of them. And they are kind of scary, but they don't have a very good save. Mm. So you kind of have to decide whether you're going to do all-out defense, all-out offense. You've got to work out how you're going to split them. If one goes down, that is a third of your army just off the board (laughs) until it can come back again, which feels super scary, but then depending on where you bring it back on, that can have a huge difference. It's like just seeing how they've approached that one force compared to, I think of the spearhead boxes, I've fought six of them so far. Mm. And every game has been close and every game has felt balanced. And Mm. that wasn't 
my experience with the few games of Combat, Combat Patrol. Patrol. You know what I'm hearing, I think, Joe? I think we should uh, just cut our losses with the Space Marine armies, pick up a little spearhead. Pick up each. a spearhead. Mm, well, I'm not going to agree to anything. Like that. <laughs> um, I think, yeah, the Combat Patrol thing uh, as well, the, the points were a bit like off. They changed the points to fit yeah. Combat Patrol and stuff like that. So I know people had some problems with that, but yeah. that's probably why it wasn't as balanced. We frequently hear from you with questions asking how you can paint like our team of world-class and award-winning artists. Teaching is something that all of the team here at Siege are very passionate about, and we want to share with you the methods and techniques that we use to paint every single day, all of the incredible miniatures and armies that you have seen from us. With the Siege Studios Patreon, you'll gain access to a growing catalogue of over 300 step-by-step -step tutorials covering a huge variety of colour schemes, miniatures, painting styles, and techniques from beginner-focused foundation tutorials to full character masterclasses. Each lesson comes in a beautifully designed and easy-to-follow PDF format with accompanying artist commentary with new tutorials added every single week. Your subscription also includes access to our private patron channels on Discord so that you can interact directly with our artists asking for questions or feedback. You'll also be supporting the podcast directly, helping us to bring you these episodes every single week. So if you want to take your painting to the next level and make the most of your very valuable hobby time, head over to patreon.com forward slash siege studios question of the week time thank you everyone for submitting your questions for question of the week if you have a question that you'd like us to answer on a future episode of the podcast please do leave it down below in the comments uh this week we've got a question from Heim, <laughs> hive mind goes om nom who says how do you know where to start painting every time i paint a miniature i can never decide where to begin skin armor cloth whatever i choose it always feels wrong or leads to more mess than intended Mm. Where do you like to start a model? When you're looking at a giant kit bashed monstrosity <laughs> and you've, you know, let's say you've sprayed it all undercoated, whatever, where where do you start? I mean, because I, I I actually think I'd probably feel like feel like this commenter if you put one of those. I in mean, front of me. to be fair, I I do as well. <laughs> Usually I I tend to for, especially if it's something for metal, I have the same thing no matter what, which is to always have the same base coat. Um so I only ever tend to do silver armor. So if it's anything in silver armor, it's always exactly the same process. And it's, I forget the name of the paint. It's a Vallejo air paint, and it's the really dark silver metallic, which for some reason just makes everything look better. Whatever mm. you put over the top of it somehow looks better than if you'd done anything else. Um, it, I think for me, it depends on like what the main volume of the model is. So if it's mostly flesh, then I'll just block in all of that first. Um, a lot of the stuff that I tend to do for bigger models is using um, like enamels or oils. Mm. So it's usually using an airbrush and then a dry brush to just highlight everything, get a kind of lighter skin tone of just either white or like gray and then building up to a, a bright white and then going over that with something watered down to then like rub away with white spirit and stuff. Um, but getting the main block of color on, I tend to find it just helps in making everything else work. Cause if I, if I haven't got like the main block of color, I can't, this is going to sound like such a weird thing to bring up right at the end. I, I can't visualize things. So, <laughs> mm. which I, really I, get, like, I get what you mean. I, I literally, uh, my thing on this, you must, you must be, see the irony in this though. Uh, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, my my thing on this was gonna be, cause I base coat everything first, yeah, before completing like a section or whatever. But the reason I do that is because I can't look at it and go, if I was just to paint a cloth, or we joked before about how people just paint a leg so that it's finished and they can post it on Instagram or something. I can't like think in my head like, oh, I don't know how that's gonna look with this other thing. So I at least get all the base colors on first, and I'd do a similar thing. I'd go from Highest volume to lowest, basically, I think. While I think there's a lot of value in that, one thing I I used to, this is what James preaches, funny enough, is the he likes to paint by like whatever the biggest color is first. Yeah. In terms of like how much of it is there is on the model. Yeah, it's like yeah. 50%. That's kind of what I'm getting. Yeah, yeah, sure. My thing is I will paint the hardest to reach areas the, first. This is the only thing that takes precedent over it is because... Obviously, like you've got a way up where there's going to be tidying up. So if you've got something, you get it a lot with like orcs or like something that's maybe got skin on show and then they've got some like straps and things over the skin. 
even if the skin isn't taking up as much of the room, you kind of want to paint that first because it's 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 further back almost yeah. like inside. Well, I even if it's a model that's say not particularly like complicated in terms of say it's a fairly open pose and it's fairly easy to access everything. My second step before getting to majority color, like this would take priority over that as well. I'll go like the inside out. Yeah. So I'll start in like the middle of the model and start working my way out. Cause what I'll often find is say for example, Maureen's got like cloth, uh, like a tablet or something. It looks way, if there's going to be a mistake or a spill, it's way more plausible that there would be some cloth on the armor than some armor on the cloth, if that mm. makes sense. So if, in particular with a Marine, if he's got like the tablet down the middle, if I spill a little bit onto the armor, it will probably blend in. But if, I, if I'm doing my blood angels and I spill a little bit of red onto the cloth, mm. you yes. see that I've made the mistake. Yeah. It's much more visually evident. Doing doing like, I, I always try and do like cloaks and cloth last because I, I st I'm still very locked into doing things via dry brushing or stippling, which can be a bit messy at times. And the thing that I've absolutely never recovered from was doing all the cloth on Shalaxi Hellbane in like a really rich, like purple pink. And it's like the best cloth I'd ever painted. <laughs> and then I knocked a bottle of Streak and Grime over whilst it was on oh. the table. And did it touch the skin? No. Did it go all over the cloth? Yes, and I hadn't varnished it. Oh. And that that became a lesson that just reverberated. Like it wasn't even related to me making like a painting mistake. It was just I literally was shaking the uh shaking the pot. I put it down and the cap was loose and I hadn't realized it was loose. And I caught it and it just oh. went everywhere, all over a monitor as well, which was not great. Um, <laughs> but I was less upset about the monitor. I was like, yeah. it took so long to paint that. Okay. And like since that point now, it's a case of I will do everything except for like maybe final highlights on a model and then I will do the cloth and then I will be so incredibly careful. Yeah. Like just sorting out any bits where I've kind of overstippled or like caught with a dry brush, I'll fix that afterwards. And even if it looks like that armor is a little bit more pristine, I much prefer that over everything anything being wrong with the cloth yeah, yeah. I, just, I can't take the heartbreak at the same <laughs> yeah. time. I just can't cope with it there was um, there we, was there a story a little while ago on like a quite an older episode where james like <laughs> james was using like resin base like to, to do like water effect oh he was doing yeah. like a resin pour he was yeah. doing like a resin pour oh, I, remember this, I remember this now <laughs> i can't remember the exact story we'll dig out the episode number and put it in the comments or whatever but um he ended up like it <laughs> leaked out. He, it leaked out of the bottom of the. He'd done like a. He had like a diorama or something. He'd done a resin pour. It all looked perfect. Yeah. He left it overnight and he came back. It had leaked out the bottom and it had stuck itself to the desk. Oh, and it so he had like, to get rid of the model and the desk. <laughs> he had to get oh. a new desk. <laughs> Do you know what's a mistake I make? An embarrassing amount of times, even now as a professional painter. Mm -hmm. The amount of times I drop models onto my wet palette, like face down, <laughs> yeah. just like, you know, perfectly, oh, this, this, you know, Space Marine's face looking brilliant. And then I'll just drop it and it'll just face yeah. palm. Like. You never, never stop dropping models into your palette. You only get better at tidying up. <laughs> yeah. That is fact. Okay. Our closing tradition on the podcast, if you're new around here, it's a segment which we call Hobby Hacks. This is where we give you a quick little tip that you can incorporate into your painting because we know a lot of you like to paint a long way listen to the episodes and as is tradition we do this with our guests so Kirioth what is your hobby hack for the episode uh, do not glue anything straight away always blue tack first always I've, I've, I used to just go I'm just gonna I'm just gonna glue this in it'll be fine and then go oh the placement of that was bad specifically on one of the mega gargans mm. the one with like the two really big wings um, one of the wings is too low it's just too low it's like if it was actually on it on the wings were on its back, one wing is like there and the other one's there yeah. where the joint is. And that's because I didn't account for the fact that the model is leaning up and round. Right. So the the wings wouldn't be in the same place. They'd one yeah, would be slightly higher than the other. So I mean, I notice every time I pick it up, no one else has picked it up on like picked up on it, but I notice every time. Mm. Until now we've told everyone. Until about now it. I've told everyone. Um <laughs> And the other thing is that quite a lot of the time when I'm like, if someone says, how did you do like the skin on something? Liquid green stuff. I think I'm the only person in the world who buys it. 
which <laughs> works out well for me because I need a lot of it. <laughs> but liquid green stuff is one of the most useful things Games Workshop makes is makes for blending from one like one kind of organic part to another. So if you've got a model where it's got something else's arms or legs and it's skin showing, you can literally just layer on liquid green stuff until it fills whatever gap is there. And the more you brush it in the same direction and use fresh over the top after it's like cured a little bit, the more you just get stretched skin. Mm. You don't have to sculpt it. You don't have to like make up proper green stuff and then go at it with proper tools and water. Um, like almost all of the joints between things that are just skin to skin or on a couple of them, like from skin into like the, the big tower on the back of that monster, the join between those is just layers of liquid green stuff brushed on because it looks like the skin is growing up mm. to cover the, the stonework. And all I had to do is just sit there and go, brush, 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 <laughs> brush, brush, leave that for a couple of hours. There we go. Go back to that. Brush, brush. <laughs> Almost no work, but it I can't find anything that works better than that outside of sitting down and properly sculpting it. Yeah. And it I mean, I've I've kind of I set the challenge to a friend of mine who is quite good at sculpting, and at the end of it, she just went, just you should just use liquid green stuff. It's it's less effort and it looks exactly <laughs> the same. And I don't like that. That's <laughs> a really good like, tip, actually. I've not heard that because I've heard a lot of the complaints about liquid green stuff, which has put me off because I always thought of it as like you're putting a tank together. And you've got a gap, but the idea of using it is like liquid texture. Yeah. For yeah. and because, like you said, because you're brushing it, because it's brush strokes. Yeah. It's giving you like directional, like skin folds and it's, stretches. It's one, of the, it's one of the best things for for kit bashing, especially kind of fantasy stuff, because of the fact that it's it's super easy to work. It just depends on what you want to use it for. If you're using it to fill in for actual like solid green stuff, it won't work for that. But if you're using it to like bridge gaps between two parts, it works super well. Similar thing with truck, with like if you want to make um, elements look more weathered or more decayed, using texture paint for that as well. So um, I think it's the Agrelin Earth, the one that kind of cracks. Mm. I use that a lot in in kit bashes because on metal it looks like it's flaked and rusting. On skin, it can look diseased if you use it kind of alternately with liquid green stuff, you end up with a very kind of Nurgle effect to it. Mm. Those two, like those two things, I always have like three or four pots of it just at any given point because if I'm going to put two things together, the chances are I'm going to use one or both to <laughs> make them like look like they belong in the same space. And a huge amount of like the Mega Gargans especially is just, it doesn't look like it, but it's just liquid green stuff all over the place. So yeah, it's. I love super that. I've hardly he heard anyone ever talk about liquid green. Not in a positive way, anyway. I've seen it. <laughs> I think I'm the to only be honest, I've, who buys it. I've like seen it in shops and stuff, and it just got to a point where like I don't really know what it is at this point. I'm too afraid to ask. It's just been there the whole time. No one spoke about it. <laughs> yeah. I'll just continue to ignore it as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's one of the most like maligned products they have, but I think it just depends on what you're using it for. If you can find like the right application for it, then it ends up being super, super useful. Like, yeah. I did have, I did buy it once because I thought. Oh, well, you've never used it. You just got it in the pot. I've never used it. It's a, it's a, yeah. Why did you buy it? I think I thought that. Oh, so where it's all connecting. Where it's connecting the, the stone to the body. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's, that's no, that liquid is green stuff. Also, the legs. The legs don't fit the body on the front because they're the a set of back legs. Yeah. But you can use liquid green stuff to kind of drag up Connect and out so that you end up with like a proper you've, you've totally like sold flesh. Me. You've totally well, sold so me. So that, that isn't one part. That isn't like meant to connect to no. each other. Oh, okay. I thought it was just the building. No, was... the, the the body of that guy is upside down. The head is the right way up. Oh, you did say earlier. Yeah, sorry. Okay, I'll get yeah. what you... Yeah. And he's, he's got back legs on the front and yeah. the back because <laughs> yeah. the front legs are too tall. But it does look like you've just... The only thing that looks like it's, com like it's added yeah. is the, is the, the building, building yeah. part on the top. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah I bought some um, years and years ago when... Uh, yeah, I guess maybe fairly new to it because I thought, yeah, I'll try a bit of sculpting, whatever, like, or or I'll try and like fill fill the gaps and stuff. Um, got it home. I don't know what in the, in the pot. What texture it actually is it? Is it like like paint as or? thin as a paint? Or it's, it's thicker than paint. It's it's more watery than you you might think. Right. Um, but it's not. 
it's nowhere near solid enough to really do kind of proper sculpting work with until it's dried a bit. But even by then, depending on what you've got it on, like if it's on a flat surface, you'll end up kind of cutting through to whatever it is that is right. underneath it. So my one, when I opened it, was like, it kind of looked like um, the like texture paint, like the basin paint. And it yeah. was all like kind of like dry and sort of, if the seal isn't proper on it, it so it's like it's half it set almost. Yeah. So yeah. I got it and I was like, I have no idea what to do with this. <laughs> so I just closed it and put it away. Yeah. I was like, oh, okay, maybe I had, maybe I had an iffy one then. Yeah. I need to get another one. Well, that is a very compelling sales pitch for yeah. the for the stuff. I'll be yeah. honest. No, you've sold me. That's a brilliant hobby hack. I, I shouldn't do that because I need it. <laughs> I need it. And if people start buying, this is it. like James talking about all the retro paints on the podcast. Yeah. It's like, yeah. He's got competitors now on the eBay bid. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much for sharing your kit bashing wisdom with us novices. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, Anytime. Of course, all of your links will be in the description for anyone. Check out your channel. Uh, do urge you to subscribe. I've been a fan of your channel for many years. So uh, thank very you. cool having you on. Yeah. Very cool having you on the show. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Uh, we'll catch you next week. Bye.